Many years ago, my wife and I were in South Africa, and we went to a park called uh, Kruger National Park in South Africa. When they were facing an overpopulation of those elephants, they decided to separate the youngest elephants, or the younger elephants, because they were eating all the vegetation. So they took 300 of the young male elephants and separated them from the influence of the older mature elephants. They moved them 300 uh, miles away. They were male elephants. Now in this Mfuzi uh, reserve, they had no elephants there, but it happened to be the natural terrain of the rare white rhino. Now we saw white rhino. The, the rhino has no natural enemies. It's not prey for anything. It's too mean, too tough, too fast, and too strong for anything to attack it. So there's no, no uh, at all, there's no one against this rhino. It ab absolutely stands by itself. But to the amazement of the authorities, they begin to find dead rhinos all over the park. They couldn't figure out why, so they put cameras out around the park. They put these cameras out all around the park to see, you know, what was the case. And, and here's their finding. Uh, when they put these cameras out, they found that these young male elephants with no mature influence in their lives were forming into packs and gangs to kill the rhinos. Something that was not in their nature to do. Interesting story, isn't it? Sounds familiar. Sounds like the streets of America. Sounds like the gangs of America. Perhaps this is what Isaiah was speaking prophetically about into our day when he said these words, Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. And he said, In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, We will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Now, this prophecy is that there will be a time, maybe like now, that there will be a, such a shortage of mature discerning godly men that the woman will out the women will outnumber the men seven to one. Now the woman in Isaiah 4 said at the end here, and I want you to get this, take away our disgrace. Take away our disgrace. The word there in the uh, Amplified and the New American Standard says it this way. Take away our reproach. That word today is the word that God wants us to hear. I want you to follow me. Take away, I'm going to say it again, take away our reproach. What does it mean? A reproach is a supernatural condition of shame or disgrace that settles into a person's spirit coloring every aspect of their life. You have a generation of men that have become shameful and, 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 and shamed of their life and maybe shamed of their failures. Reproaches are demonic devices that leave us feeling disgraced or unworthy. Psalm 44, verse 15 and 16. Reproaches work to surround us with the lies of the enemy. My dishonor is continually before me and the shame of my face has covered me. Wow. How many of you know that one of the paralyzing things in Christendom is when someone falls or someone does something that they know is not right, there's a shame that comes over them. And because of that shame, then the church sees it, thinks maybe they're continually in that condition and doesn't know how to embrace them. 
and we need to really take a hard look at this. Is this what's covering the youth of America? Is this what's on their face? Uh, have they been disgraced? Do they feel unworthy? Do they feel like there's a covering on them uh, that's covered their face of shame? Reproach changes the way we see ourselves. They established a mindset of shame that is contrary to contrary to the way God sees them. Isn't that something? Reproach changes the way we see ourselves. Like a heavy cloud, reproach blacks out the light and the warmth of a father and a father's love, leaving us in a chill of hopelessness. Look what Psalm 69 says in verse 19. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Look at this. Reproach has broken my heart and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. Hello. And for my and and for comforters, but I found none. That if you could take a hundred men out of the city of Baltimore. And you could have them sitting down with lie detectors and you could really quiz them. I believe you would find that those young men would come forth with a statement that says, I am ashamed. Hello? I'm ashamed of what I've done. I'm ashamed of who I've become. I'm ashamed of the compromises in my life. How many of God's people? Feel the same way, sitting in the house of God, and they know that things aren't right. David's inner struggle with reproach, it says that it broke his heart and drove him into depression. There's the barrenness that people that feel barren, they don't produce anything. Maybe in the natural, they haven't been able to have a child. Or maybe they feel unfruitful in their labor for the kingdom or their labor at work, and they feel like they are barren. Joshua tells us something because there's also the reproach of past failures. How many of you know sometimes we mess up? Hello. Joshua chapter 5. And, and look at verse 7. I love this scripture. And Joshua, then Joshua circumcised their sons when he raised up, uh, when he raised up in their place. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on their way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were, till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. We're living in a time where, where there's a generation of men who have become so ashamed of their failures. I'll tell you another thing that people fall under, and that is the, 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 the reproach of poverty. How many of you hear that? When a spirit of poverty comes on people and they, they can't provide for their families and they, they, they can't keep a job or they can't get a job and they go under the burden of that. How many of you know that that thing is breaking people's hearts? I believe there's some men out there that don't want to be tonight selling dope and doing something stupid. I believe they'd like to, but because of circumstances and events, and you say, well, everybody can get a job if they want. Yeah, I do. I say that. But I had to tell you, saints, there's a lot of things that have been put out there that have put on a, a, a covering, like David said, over the mouth, over the face, over the life, the minds of a generation. And they're condemned. How do you hear that? And we need to be able to reach into them. You run into them every day. You work around them every day. Hello? Maybe we need to look at it from that angle and say, how am I embracing those around me? Am I helping heap coverings uh, of guilt on them? Or am I helping them to know that they can get out of that guilt and get that reproach off of them and they can live a redeemed life?
Ezekiel 36, 30, and I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you, uh, that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. God said, I'll remove the, the reproach of your, of your poverty. How many of you want that reproach to get taken off of you? How many of you know poverty is a reproach? Verse 37, thus saith the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock. And then he says in verse 38, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock of Jerusalem on its feast days, so shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I'm the Lord. Part of the redemption plan is that flocks of men are going to be restored into the city streets of America. And there will be men that are restored like flocks of men. And there won't be a 7-1 ratio. There will be a better balance. And men will be restored because integrity will come back. And worth will come back. And we'll see our children stop killing. And we'll see a lot of things change. Joshua chapter 7 and verse 7, I mean 5 and 7 and 9. The sons who were raised up in Egypt were circumcised, and the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. This place called Gilgal, which means liberty, that my record got removed. When the court of heaven got called together, the ancient of days, the judge of all judges, when he stood there and the accuser of the brethren came running in and he had written down what I had done. When he went to show it to the judge, the blood of Jesus had washed it clean. And when he held up the document, the document said, sorry. The judge said, look at your own document. There's nothing written there. It's been erased by the blood of the lamb. And we need to transfer that anointing uh, into the church, uh, into the life uh, of the body of Christ. If this were possible, saints, I ain't going to mess your hair up. There's a lot of brothers and sisters in the church, saints. We don't even know who they are because they're covered with shame. Because they messed up at one time, way back. And the church, they've jumped from church to church, from church to church, because they can't find a place where somebody will just look past it and say, you've been redeemed, brother, it's okay. And all of a sudden, we come under the banner of the Holy Ghost, and he yeah. takes that thing off. Man, what a new day. The light looks better. We see her, brother. We say, hey, it's okay, man. You messed up. It's okay. You just, you just keep going. Don't look back. You say, Lord, thank you that we can lift the shame of others. And you know, when somebody's lift the shame off of you, then you go on a mission helping people lift that shame off of others. Come on. You start lifting that shame. You start saying, hey, it's okay. 